Okay, everyone, we're going to get started here pretty soon. Um, I uh, want to uh, thank you all for continuing the conversation. And one of the things that we've, of course, missed in doing live programming and having to go over to virtual is just the magic of what an Adventures and Ideas seminar is all about. I don't know if any of you have been to, I mean, I know most of you have been to live seminars, but I don't know if or some of you haven't been to any of our live seminars before. The type of conversations that we are hearing are, are typical of the type of wonderful conversations that continue uh, after uh, our speakers and after our events to have that opportunity for interchange. So uh, although this is a little confusing to do this this way, I'm really happy to be able to see that being recreated here uh, with those in exchanges. Um, so please, in our next breaks during lunch, if you want to stay on and continue talking, that really is the magic of what we do. And soon enough, folks will be able to do it um, uh, live again. I also want to thank everyone for putting things in the in the chat. Uh, I will be well behind the output of Paul Connick and Jonathan Gerard in, in terms of keeping up with all of that. Uh, but um, certainly keep putting things in there and I'll be coming in and uh, trying to find ways to bring your comments into the discussion. Uh, you'll also notice, of course, that uh, uh, Jeff Sam Record is very uh, open to having you turn on your mic and go ahead and ask a question as well. So please remember you have that uh, reactions thing there. If you want to, it certainly is one way to bypass me and not have to wait for me to go through the chat. You're welcome to do that as well. Um, and uh, I, I believe that Jeff Sam Record will be coming back on soon, but I do want to make sure that we... Um, Again, play up. We are very excited. We're going to have our first live event in a really long time this Thursday. So um, if you haven't signed up for it yet um, and you're interested in Chopin, Robert Buxton is a brilliant pianist. We have one thing that's changed, unfortunately, and we felt like it was worth it. The program was originally an hour and a half. Due to protocols, we're only allowed to have one hour of time for the live performance. So that is one change, but we think it's worth it uh, to be able to hear that beautiful grand piano and Miser Auditorium live. Uh, so um, again, if you haven't signed up for it, please do. If you have signed up for it, you don't have to do anything else. Uh, we can check you in and see you uh, at Hill Hall on Thursday. And look who it is. It's Jeffrey Sarah McCord is back and joining us. Um, did everyone, did you enjoy your break, Jeff? I did, used well. Used well. Okay, well, I'm turning it back over to you, sir. Once again, please welcome Jeff Sarah McCord. Good to see you guys back. Um, okay, so we ended the first session with the challenge. Challenge is, explain to me what's so good about being a just person. And here's why I want you to do it. It looks like there's a lot of good reasons to think uh, the only thing good about being a just person is found in its consequences. And then only sometimes. And at the very end of the challenge, Adiamantus considers two objections. It's hard to be a successfully, a successful unjust person, not worth the trouble. And the other is, you may be able to fool all the people all the time, but you won't fool God, you'll pay. Now in the book, interestingly, uh, Adiam Montes responds to each argument. So the first argument, he just points out sometimes things really worth doing are hard. That it's hard doesn't mean the balance consequences don't favor being unjust and working hard to get away with it. And anyway, sometimes it's not that hard. Then when the God will get you, he says, well, either, and you can remember uh, Pascal here, here, either, and remember what their theology was like, either there are some gods or there aren't. If there aren't any gods, then this argument doesn't matter. If there are some gods, what do we know about them? Well, here's what we know about them. Again, thinking back to the time, we know that uh, they'll forgive us if we give enough to the temples. So uh, what we have to do is plan our life to take full advantage of injustice and then on our <coughs> deathbed, donate. And so, you know, 
we don't have to worry about that either. And then, you know, in, in the Middle Ages, there were indulgences. The Catholic Church uh, had a way of paying, in effect, to get into heaven. But notice that those replies, however interesting they are, miss a problem that both objections have, given the context of this discussion. Can somebody just tell me what's wrong with, single thing is wrong with both objections. Everything again is, uh, John, I have to hear, uh, you're, you're still not talking about the intrinsic goodness of being just. It's all still about the cosmos. We're still waiting for you to break through and tell us what inherently is wonderful about being just. Exactly right. These, these two objections are, in an important sense, just irrelevant. Even if it were true, it's not worth the trouble to be unjust. Or even if it were true, God will punish you. At most, that would be an argument appealing to the consequences for being just and would be no argument at all that justice is intrinsically good, good for its own sake. So this is, it's, it's really an important fact that these familiar arguments like the arguments I mentioned before from what I called parents, teachers, and preachers, it's just another case of appealing to consequences. So against that background, Socrates says, this is really hard. I think the first thing we need to do is try to figure out what justice is. And then he says, I have an idea. I mean, we're trying to figure out what would it be for Byron to be a just person? What is it about Byron that makes him count as a just person? And he says, well, how am I going to figure this out? I have an idea, he says. We don't just call people just or unjust. We think of societies as just or unjust. And societies are much bigger things. So maybe it'll be easier to find justice in a city than it is to find justice in an individual. And he gives an analogy of, you know, if you were challenged to tell me what was on written on a sign a mile away that I could barely see there was writing on. And then I realized, oh, I think a copy of that sign is here on my phone. I did this recently trying to read the serial number on my iPad, which I can't read, but I could take a picture of it and blow up the picture. And then I could see what the serial number was. So Sari says, suppose you have to figure out the serial number on your iPad. Here's an idea, read the serial number in the picture. And as long as the picture really is a picture of the iPad, you'll at least get a hint of what it is. So his idea is, and he does give the sign analogy, he says you can't be sure they say the same thing, but it's, it's an idea. Let's figure out what justice is in a city. And if justice is the same in the city as it is in the individual, let's carry the idea to the individual and see if we can confirm it applies there. So he's hoping, he's supposing, that the term justice isn't ambiguous between two meanings. Unlike bank in English, if you want to figure out what a bank is, maybe or maybe not, you, you learn by going to the side of a river. It depends whether the kind of bank we're interested in is a geographical phenomenon or a financial institution. So he says we call people just and we call states just if the word means the same thing maybe we can figure out justice in the state more easily and then we'll check whether it carries over now in fact we're reading the book so we know he had this hunch and then he thought the hunch paid off and he not only thought the hunch paid off he thought Talking about justice in the state is really useful for some purpose anyway. 
So I'm going to leave it in the book rather than just jumping to the individual. I'm going to do I'm going to give the discussion of justice in the state short shrift just because of our time limits. It's been unbelievably influential. It's hugely interesting. And it starts this way with the observation that if we were looking for justice in the state, it's probably a waste of time to look at any actual existing state. All real states, he thinks, are rife with injustice one way or another. If we're going to find justice, not that there's no justice in the states, but it's just a messy amalgam full of injustice and justice and all sorts of other things. He says, here's what we should do. Let's build the perfect state the ideal constitutional arrangement, hoping that if anywhere, that's where we'll find justice. And he, in effect, builds on the theory of justice that Glaucon put on the table. So he starts with the question, why are there societies at all? Why are there city-states or countries? And he says, well, because if you're going to understand the ideal version of a state, you have to understand what's the function of a state? What's the point of there being a state? And he says, well, the point is found in the fact that we're not self-sufficient. Right. Moreover, not only do we need each other, we can benefit each other significantly. So this is a lot like the story of justice. If we just were autonomous, independent agents, life would be pretty miserable and we'd die quickly. If we come together and address the fact that we're not self-sufficient, we'll be better off. In effect, the idea is something like, a well-run state is a state that's a cooperative venture for mutual gain, something we can each see ourselves benefiting from. And he goes through, you know, what, what do we benefit from? Well, we need food, shelter, clothes, protection, company, affection. How do we get that? By coming together. Then he asks, so when we've come together, how should we manage things? And he argues the first still extant ex argument for division of labor, something Adam Smith got famous for. But Socrates says, so how should we divide up work? Should we all farm together and then cook together and then sew together. And he says, well, that's hugely inefficient. We actually all do better if we have division of labor. And he says, um, you know, we need people to specialize in farming while people are cooking, while people are sewing, while people are building houses. And then he asks, how should that happen? And he says, well, if things go well, we should, it should be that, I mean, people are different. They have different talents, different abilities. We should get the people who have the relevant skills doing the different jobs. And of course we're building an ideal, but if you're just thinking what would be an ideal state, somehow a, a community where everyone benefits from being a part of the community, our needs are provided for, and the way we structure things, they're provided for by the people most qualified to provide the various things. So even though I like to cook, I'm not a great cook, a pretty good mechanic. If things worked out well, I'd be doing the mechanics and somebody else would be doing the cooking. 
that's the image he gives us. And then he says, okay, well, once this all gets going and it's efficient, how should we set up exchange? You know, you're making clothes, John, and Katie's working with me as a mechanic and Byron's building houses, but Byron needs food. He needs his machines fit. How, how should this work? And you get a defense of a market economy with money. So he thinks it would be bad to have just a barter system, hugely inefficient. When I come and I need food, I need to be coming with a mechanical thing that somebody with food needs. Better to put into place a universal solvent, a medium of exchange that isn't itself the good. And he argues for a market economy. Again, I'm going very fast. Okay. So, for instance, at 371C, he writes, why, why uh, not a barter economy? Quote, if a farmer or any other craftsman brings some of his products to market and he doesn't arrive at the same time as those who want to exchange things with him, he will sit idly in the marketplace away from his own work. Much better to come, have somebody give him money, he can then use then or later to buy some food from someone who doesn't need what he brought to the market. Now, what you guys should be doing through all this quick spiel is asking yourself, yeah, is he right about this or not? Is there an alternative that would be better? If you think of a kibbutz, it's not arranged this way. At least some are not. Is that a better way to arrange a community or a worse way? Pretend, suppose, I wonder whether. You think so far he's said things that are true. People are not self-sufficient. We do better if we work together. A well-run society would be one in which everyone benefits by being a member of it. That's not obviously not true of every society but we're building an ideal society. And if everyone's made better by it, how should we organize the work that needs to be done? He thinks division of labor. And then how should we arrange for exchange? He thinks a market economy. You need to ask, has he gone wrong yet? Katie. Did Socrates address slavery in this? An unwilling labor? Um, not yet. But it is the case that he thinks uh, it, it emerges that a society that has slavery is, according to his count, an unjust society. Um, Unless, as Aristotle did, you assume certain outrageous things about the slaves. Because there's a condition on an ideal society that everyone benefit. And to the extent the benefit is merely exploitative, uh, it violates that condition. Now, whether that's injustice or just less than ideal, we need to know what justice is and we don't yet have any idea. We're just building the ideal state, supposing we'll find justice in it. So notice so far, there's no slavery in this state. Matter of fact, there's pressure against any kind of slavery because everybody has to benefit from being a participant. And if there's a way to better arrange things so that some people do even better and nobody suffers, if there's what's called, uh, uh, if it's not yet Pareto optimal, I don't know how many people know that phrase, but if there's a Pareto horizon, opportunity to make some people better off without making anybody worse off, Socrates thinks we ought to do it. So he, his opposition to a barter economy isn't that it's unjust. It's not that it hurts people. His objection is, it's pitifully inefficient given what we could do. Of course, it's an invention to come up with money. 
And it's an invention that's good to have only when the community gets to be a certain size, when it's not just a small family sharing everything. But that's how he's thinking about it right now. Then he says, let me harp on one thing here for a minute. The division of labor according to ability, talents, and education is really important to him. He thinks, he doesn't tell us how we arrange this. He just thinks it's really important you get the right people being the doctors and the right people being the builders. You don't just let people do whatever they feel like doing because other people will suffer at the very least from less benefit than they could have had. But again, there's no theory here about how we get people yet, how we get people to want to do the jobs they're well suited to do. So the next thing he does is he says, you know, once everything's up and running, what will life be like? And he describes the life. And the life is pastoral, peaceful, satisfied with not very much. It's not a society of aggressive acquisition. So he describes people having dinner together, eating berries and nuts and uh, talking together in a relaxed way. And Adiamantus objects. He says, look, this isn't an ideal city. I mean, it would be ideal if we were building a city for pigs. But for human beings, where's the wine? Where's the couches? Where's the entertainment? Where's the meat? Where's the richness of life? And Socrates says, oh, I see what you mean. You're thinking that once people get what they need, they're going to start wanting more. And he says, I really think I've described the ideal. If only people were able just to be satisfied with what they need. But I grant you a feverish city, a city in which people don't just want what they need, they want more and other things, is probably the only realistic thing about human beings. Not that every human being is like that. There are ascetics, there are monks who live with just what they need. But if we're building a society for real human beings who differ in all sorts of ways, we need to take account of people have desires for luxury. It says the dangerous thing about this is first, we're going to start producing more than we need. And we're going to be targets of opportunity to other societies that want what we're making. Moreover, once we give ourselves into desires for more than we need, we're going to start wanting what other people have. And so we're going to need in our society soldiers to protect us against external threat and a police force to protect us against internal temptation. Because it's not an ideal city for real human beings to suppose that we're all always angels. Once we're acknowledging, we're people who start to look over at the next house and say, I want what they have. So he says, we end up with this group of people, he calls them guardians, who we want to be careful who's in this role. Not just anybody who loves carrying around a gun and dressing up in uniform should be allowed to be in the army or the police force. We want to select people, the right people, to play this role. And he has a nice little discussion. Are there people like this who could ferociously defend us against threats and yet treat us lovingly? And he says, to my great pleasure, ah, it seems like that's not possible, but it is. Look at dogs. Dogs can fiercely defend you from external threat and defend you against 
the unknown, but love you when they know you. He, he says amusingly, that's the philosophical soul of dogs. They love knowledge. Um, so he says, look, we can find people who would be good police officers and good soldiers. And in our ideal society, we manage to get the right people in those positions. And then he says, we also need somebody to pass the laws. Who will those be? And he tells a long story about the proper education of citizens and the training of guardians and the training of potential rulers. Here you get the first still extant articulation of a defense of censorship. He argues that kids shouldn't be exposed to pornography, to violence, to video games, to poetry, or violent fables. Now, he doesn't mention all those things explicitly, but he says what kids are exposed to, what's held up as models to them, what they see in the world affects their character. And we need to be very careful in our educational system to get people to see what's truly valuable and to love the society they're in. And so he goes on about the proper education. And this includes of the guardians who need to be carefully selected and the rulers. And especially the rulers need to be people who love the city as they love themselves. That is, their good is the good of the city. And he thinks to get another kind of ruler in there who has the services of the army and the police force is the downfall of the ideal city. So if you have legislators who are not thinking what's best for the whole city, what's promoting the organization of our society in a way that makes it beneficial to all, they've screwed up. Okay, so still we don't we haven't said anything about justice, remember. He ends this <coughs> section suggesting a religion, suggesting that we raise everybody in the city to believe that they have a common father or mother. And that we raise people to think they have a purpose in life. Each of us, every one of us has a purpose and the purposes are not the same. He thinks if we could only raise people to believe this, society we'd be much better off. If people looked at their fellow citizens not as competitors, but as brothers and sisters, if they saw themselves as having a calling, and if they could have as their calling what they were well suited to do, everything would be pretty wonderfully well run. Now, he describes it as a myth, and it's a myth where our calling is gold in our soul, or silver, or iron, or bronze, but the underlying idea is, if people in our society believe they had a common mother or father, if they believe they had a purpose in life and that purpose was to contribute to society, to follow their strengths, to help others, everything would be better. He thinks also though, human nature being what it is, we have to make sure that the rulers and the guardians don't have private property. And he has this long description. He thinks letting them have private property inevitably leads human beings to be tempted. And if the people with the real power are tempted to make laws or to enforce laws according to their own interest and acquisitive natures, things will go to hell in a handbasket. So he argues that society ought to be structured so that those who have the privilege of being guardians or rulers 
don't have private property, they live in common or state-owned houses, they don't even have their own kids for fear of nepotism. All of their kids are held in common and each of their kids is selected for their role in society according to their abilities, not according to whether they're your kid or not. This is where kibbutz come in. First still extant, a phrase I keep like using because the Republic is so full of them, articulation of the vision of a kibbutz is in the Republic in the description of the life the guardians would lead. But it's presented in the recognition that not everybody's built for doing that. That there's an absolutely vital role for lawyers and doctors and teachers and farmers and builders and auto mechanics. And it's people have different roles to play. And the people who play those roles are part and parcel of the market economy because they're making goods that get exchanged. Whereas the guardians and the rulers, their job is to create a state environment in which all of that flourishes and to protect it from external threat. So after that, Adi and Matis and Glaucon say, hold it, you've screwed up. This isn't an ideal say because, hey, look, the guardians and the rulers, they don't, they don't have Porsches. They don't have a swimming pool. They, they have to share housing. That's not an ideal city. How would you ever get anybody to be a ruler if you don't pay them a lot of money? So Socrates has a lovely reply to this. He says, First of all, our aim in building an ideal society is not to make any one group as happy as they possibly could be. When we're building an ideal society, we're trying to build the society in which together people are all as happy as they can be with various trade-offs. He said, it's a lot like as they did back in those days, painting a beautiful statue. To paint a beautiful statue, you don't just concentrate on the eyes and make them the most captivating possible eye eyes. You have to think about how the color of the eyes fits with the drape of the dress and the color of the scarf and the what we're creating is a whole, which the value of which is not a sum of the value of the parts. So he says, first of all, you've got to understand maybe there's some things the rulers would like to have that we should not let them have because it would be bad for the society as a whole. And then he says, but actually, if we've selected the right people, they're the people who are not materialistic. There are people who are not out after more stuff. They're out after honor and integrity or creating a good society. Not a lot of people, but if we select the right people, there are some people. So that's how he replies to that objection. So now we get to the question, what is justice? in the state. If this really is the ideal, and again, you need to ask yourself, has he, has he gotten something wrong here? And it's really important because an irritating thing about Glaucon and Adiamantis after book two is they're like bobbleheads. They just say yes to almost everything Socrates puts on the, on the table. And you sometimes want to just grab their head and say, don't agree to this so quickly. So we got to be careful not to fall into that ourselves, I suggest. Okay, so this question is, so how are we going to find justice here? And he says, I have an idea. And I think I'm going to really, how are we doing on time? How much time do we have? 
We are doing just fine on time. We believe we go till 1230. And it's 1150. Okay. And it's 1150. Yep. Okay. So here's his idea. If this is an ideal city, if, then we expect it'll have four virtues. It'll be just, courageous, wise, and moderate. So if we look in the state and we try to figure out what makes it wise and what makes it courageous and what makes it moderate, we'll know that what's left over is what makes it just. Of course, if we just start looking and we find justice right away, all the better. But the way the book unfolds is he finds every other virtue first. And I'll just summarize it really quickly, but try to bring out something important about it. He says, so in virtue of what does the city, the whole city count as wise? And he says, well, that's that's really a matter of how it's ruled. It's a city isn't wise if it has a bunch of great, really brilliant scientists or chess players in it. The city isn't brilliant if it has some wise men in it who are locked in jail or some wise women in it who are thrown to the side. No matter how many wise people there are in the city, if the city is not run wisely, the city is not wise. So the wisdom of the city rests in how the rulers settle on the rules they legislate. Now, actually, I want to tell you one true story from like 15 years ago or 20 years ago in North Carolina. There was a uh, an opportunity to build more infrastructure. And there was funding in the state for more infrastructure. So the legislature appointed a committee to analyze the opportunities in the state and to recommend where the new roads should go. Took months and months and months. Finally, the committee came out with its recommendations and I, I'm not sure this, but I believe the recommendation was to build the roads in the southeast portion of the state, primarily. Okay, expert commission, blah, blah, blah. Then it was discovered by the News and Observer that conveniently, the roads that were recommended were owned by shell companies that were owned by members of the committee making the recommendations. This was just a really vivid case of if the people who are settling the rules care about money, care about material things, and you allow them to benefit in, from their rulings, we can expect a lot of corruption. So that's, that's a real vivid case of it that you can just run through how incentives can corrupt governments. So he's really worked hard to get the right people to be the rulers. And he says, if that's worked, if we've gotten the right people, then we've gotten people who are knowledgeable and care about what the best rules for the state are. And they're motivated to pass those rules. Where's the courage of the state? Well, the courage of the state, he thinks, is found in the military and in the police force, in their willingness to put themselves collectively at risk for the good of the society, to face danger for the greater good. That's courage. A bunch of ultimate sports people who risked their life to fly, you know, to parachute with a parachute with only four strings on it, or the thing I love is the, the bat suits where you spread your wings in the arms and you have 
you're like a bat and you can are a flying squirrel and you can go down the mountains. I don't know if you guys watch that. Completely thrilling. Those people are brave and idiotic and brave, but idiotic. But no matter how many people in the state are like that, doesn't make the state a brave or courageous state. And then he turns to moderation. What makes a state moderate? Well, that the parts of the state, he's now thinking they're the rulers, they're the guardians, and then there's everyone else in the state who provides for the needs and luxuries of everyone in it. And he says, a moderate state is where these three parts each play their proper role and they uh, don't go out of bounds. I guess is the right way to put it. I shouldn't have said play their proper role. They don't go out of bounds. Um, think about moderation in a person that a person doesn't exceed their credit limit just because they have a credit card or don't exceed more than they can afford. That's moderation. It's not necessarily wisdom. It's not necessarily courage. It's something else. It's staying within the bounds. And he says, so where's justice? And he thinks, wow, this is really hard. I, I don't know where justice is. I've been looking all around. I'm looking all around. And then he announces, oh, it's been at our feet all along. It, we're like, this is almost the analogy he uses. It's like we're someone looking for the keys to the car. We're walking around the house. And then all of a sudden we decide, discover, oh, I've been holding them all along. It's been there at our feet, he says. And then the question is, well, what is it? Now, before I tell you, I just want to set you up to recognize how utterly unsatisfying it is. It's like intellectual baby food. He says, I know what it is. You know, earlier we recognized that not everyone's qualified for every job and that we ought to organize the society so that each person in each part of the city is performing the job that they're well suited to perform and not meddling in the jobs of others. You know what? Justice is a matter of each getting what's rightfully theirs and not taking from others what's rightfully in others. That's what justice is. And you want to know how I know that? Well, remember, we thought there were four virtues and we found three of them. So the one that's left over, that must be justice. So two things are unsatisfying here. We spent all, all this time just to have you pronounce that justice is a matter of each getting what's rightfully their own and not taking what so rightfully in others, that's pretty low hanging fruit, it feels like. Doesn't tell us anything. Moreover, what kind of argument is this? I mean, an argument by elimination works only if we know there are only four possibilities. But might a city be pious or might it be benevolent? Or might it be something else? Until you show me that there are only four things in my ideal city, I can't infer that the fourth thing I find, given that the others are not justice, is justice. This is a crappy argument. And a lovely thing about Socrates or about Plato is periodically he offers arguments that really stink. This will happen again shortly, that really stink but that people reading lightly kind of say, oh yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it's the thing left over. That must be justice. This is a really good thing. He immediately, immediately follows with things like, well, if you aren't convinced, consider this argument. He acknowledges right away that an argument is a bad argument. And he puts it there just because it softens people up for the conclusion he's after. At least that's how I understand it. So immediately he says, if you want to be convinced, think about this. 
remember, we're creating an ideal city. It says, suppose your job right now, you take on the job of explaining to the judges what they should do in carrying out their decisions. He's assuming, well, we're telling them how to carry out justice in their court. So what would we tell them? It says, notice, we would tell them for each person who comes before you in the court, make sure each person gets what's rightfully theirs and no one walks away with what's rightfully another's. This is what justice is and the confirmation is when you tell a judge how to do her job, you're telling her to do that. Now, of course, a judge carrying out justice in the court on this understanding is paying attention to what's legally rightfully one's own and not legally another person's. Now, there's another view, at least of what judges do, but also sometimes of what they ought to do. It's called legal realism, and it was developed mainly at the University of Chicago, at least originally. And it's the view that the judges ought to make the decisions that are financially best off for the society. It's a view that that's what judges do do. Look at how they make their decisions and though they don't offer as their reasons this, you can so successfully track what's expected to have the best financial results and the decisions made that the best explanation they think of the decisions are, they're not trying to give people what's right for <clears throat> theirs. None of that bull. They're sensitive to the evidence of what will have the best effects, financial effects primarily. So, as I said, you could think this is a, a vapid discovery that justice is each getting what's rightfully their own and what's they're not taking what's rightfully another's. But it's really, I think, deeply insightful. And I'm going to try to convince you of this. Consider some issue you think is an important issue of justice. Maybe um, slavery. Maybe abortion. Maybe despotism. Maybe, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. Take your pick. I'm just going to talk through the first two without assuming anything in particular about which side you're on. So let me just remind you of slavery in the antebellum South there were a lot of arguments about whether to maintain slavery. One argument is we would do much better financially if we didn't own the slaves, if instead they were sharecroppers, then we're not responsible for them when they stop being productive. Some people thought that was a really good argument to change the system. Other people thought, oh, the idea of one person owning another, it's disgusting. Look at how these people have to live. Other people say, I'm just not comfortable living in a society where some people are the property of others. Here's Socrates' view. So far, we're not talking about justice at all. We're talking about financial advantage. We're talking about what we like or don't like or what makes us feel comfortable or not comfortable. We haven't gotten to the question of the justice of slavery till we start asking what is rightfully whose. And when you look at the actual arguments, you see there were people on both sides. Some people were arguing these people they're my property. You can't take that from me. And other people arguing, these people have a right to their own freedom. You can't take that from them. Now we're in an argument about the nature of justice, an argument about what is rightfully whose. All the other arguments are just not about justice at all. Or switch to abortion. 
Some people are against abortion because they've seen the pictures and it makes them sick to their stomach. Other people are against abortion because there's so many possible parents out there who'd welcome a kid. Some people are against abortion because we're in danger of, I mean, think of China that's just doubled its child allotment. They're worried that they're gonna have not enough young productive people to support the elderly. So you could be against abortion for a lot of reasons. But if those are your reasons, they have nothing to do with justice. You don't get to justice until you start thinking about what is rightfully whose. And as you know, there are people on both sides. Some people say the fetus has a right to life and abortion is taking what's rightfully the fetuses away from the fetus, that's unjust. And other people argue a woman has a right to control her body and anything that forbids abortion is taking away from her control over her body that she has a right to. Now we're arguing about justice. So the gift here, such as it is, is Socrates has picked out what's distinctively at issue when we're thinking about justice, not wisdom, not kindness, not benevolence, not how we feel, not what will have the best consequences overall. We're focused on what's rightfully whose. That's what it is to be thinking about justice. Now, Socrates thinks, in light of the discussion he's had about the ideal state, that each part of the city is rightfully playing its role and that injustice of the city happens when the wrong people get to be rulers and they start legislating for the good of the whole, or when the guardians start uh, enforcing laws according to what will make them the most money or get them promoted or uh, advance their interests in carrying out violence, and or if the people who are in charge of creating the goods that enhance our life start acting in ways that actually diminish our welfare. Then injustice has happened because in the state, each part is not playing its proper role. That's what he thinks the core of justice is about the state. And he thinks importantly, in the first instance, the justice of the state has nothing to do with any other state. It doesn't have to do with how this state treats another state that becomes an issue only if there's an argument that the other state has a right not to be, say, invaded by this state. Then we'd know, oh, that's unjust. But he's not talked about that at all. He's talked about the justice of the state being a feature internal to how the state works, unrelated to its relations to any other state, at least in the first instance unrelated to how it treats the other states, except we know if it's a just state, it's a state that won't be taking from others what's rightfully someone else's. So that's his first account of the nature of justice, but it's justice of the state. And that's not really the topic here, it's justice of the person. So the question becomes, is justice the same in the person? And he thinks, well, so we've got a, an obvious next question. If justice in the state is a matter of its three parts playing their proper role, which of course depends on how people act, because the parts are playing a role only through the actions of the people who are in those parts. He says, are people analogous to the state in the relevant way? Well, let's see, do people have three parts, each part having its proper role? Because that looks like, maybe it could be four parts, but it turns out it's only three. If people have three parts to their, no, I didn't mean only three, it's three, no only there. He, 
he says, okay, if they have three parts that have their proper role, then we have a proposal of what justice in a person is. A person is just when the three parts of her soul, of her psyche, are each playing their proper role. So let's figure out whether people have three parts. And he gives a crappy argument that they do. The crappy argument is hidden in a rhetorical question. He says, well, don't we have to conclude they have three parts? I mean, where else would the state get its three parts? There are all sorts of things bad with this argument. I'm going to skip over the argument. We can come back to it because he immediately gives a brilliant argument. Here's the brilliant argument. Don't you agree, or at least are you willing to assume with me, he says, that no single thing can be in opposite states at the same time with respect to the same other thing with a single part of itself. So this is a negative claim. There is no thing, no single thing in opposite states at the same time with respect to the same thing with the same part of itself. So if we find a single thing in opposite states, at the same time with respect to the same thing, we know it can't be with a single part of itself. It must have at least two parts. And you can work through why you might believe it. I mean, it's clear things can be, single thing can be in opposite states. Being tight asleep and being wide awake are opposite states. I was tight asleep last night and I'm wide awake now. So if somebody said no single thing can be in opposite states, that's ridiculous because you can as long as you do it at different times. Okay, well, no single thing can be in opposite states at the same time. I say, well, that's ridiculous because I don't know if you can see, but there's a wall of books there and there's a wall with a picture here. I'm starting to walk. I'm both moving towards and moving away at the very same time, just not with respect to the same thing. So then the claim is, okay, okay, maybe no single thing can be in opposite states at the same time with respect to the same thing. But then look at the wall, look at my arms, watch this, this is magic. Opposite, single thing, opposite states at the same time with respect to the very same wall. I'm both moving away and moving towards the wall at the very same time. One and the same thing, opposite states with respect to the same thing at the same time, just not with a single part of myself. He thinks he can't find similar counterexamples to the claim no single thing is in opposite states at the same time with respect to the same other thing with the same part of itself. So he then says, so think about humans. Think about you, think about your friends. Have you ever been conflicted? Have you ever both wanted and not wanted something? How many people here have never been conflicted about anything? I'm not seeing any hands. What? in the world is going on when a single person is conflicted. Within her, there must be different parts. That's what's going on. This is exactly the argument Freud used when he started arguing for the id, the ego, and the superego. He pointed to internal psychological conflicts. Now, what Socrates does is he says that human beings are conflicted reveals that they have within themselves different parts. But that doesn't show the parts they have are analogous to the parts of the city. So let's think about it more. Sometimes we're just conflicted because we want money, but we want the expensive meal. So we have desires that conflict that have different objects. 
it's an argument that shows we have two different desires because otherwise we'd not be conflicted. But he says, you don't understand human psychology if you think all of our conflicts are conflicts among our desires. Because sometimes what we find is we really want something and our desires are not conflicted, but we judge that it's not good to do. Or there's something we really don't want to do and we judge that it's good to do. That's another familiar kind of conflict that human beings are in. And human beings respond differently. Sometimes people go with their desires. Sometimes they go with their judgments of what would be best. But he says, how should we think about all this? And he said, well, here's, here's a good way to think about it. Human beings have appetites or desires. And those things are really important for us to have, just as having workers in a city are really important. Without desires, we would never pursue what we need. We'd never pursue the things that enhance our lives. So desires are, appetites are, the prompts to action and attention the pursuit of which often enrich our lives the way the workers in a well-run city are producing goods that enhance the welfare of the whole. He says, but there's a part of us, the part that doesn't just ask, what do I want? But asks instead the question, what would be best for me to do? And answers that question. That's our reason, he says. It's the capacity we have to ask and answer the question, what would be best for me to do? And we know this is separate from desire because it can result in an answer different from the question, what do I most desire? And there can be conflicts among them. And then he says, is there a third part? And he ends up arguing there is a third part. He calls it spirit. It's a part of our psyche that lets us take pride or get angry or embarrassed. And it's well suited to obey the judgments of reason, to get embarrassed about things that we should be embarrassed about, to get angry about the things that'd be good to get angry about. But he thinks it's not the same as reason because for instance, people who don't have reason or animals that don't have reason still have the capacity to get angry or embarrassed or ashamed. Little kids and animals, he thinks, at least some animals. So he says, if spirit can exist without reason existing, then they can't be the same thing. So we end up with the following picture, following way to understand humanity, human nature. We each have three parts, an appetitive part, a spirited part, and a reasoning part. And in an ideal person, those are all coordinated, reason rules, spirit enforces and protects, and appetites provide for what enhances life. So he thinks, the way to understand an ideal person is analogous to the way to understand an ideal state. Now, let me point out, when we were talking about the state, he didn't claim the state has only three parts. It might have trade unions in it. It might have golf clubs in it. It'll have families in it, have all sorts of things. He thinks the three parts he divided the city into are the parts the appreciation of which is important to understanding how cities work when it comes to their wisdom, their justice, their courage, and their moderation. Similarly with people, he never argues that people have only three parts to their psychology. He never argues that the best way to understand human beings for every purpose is by supposing they have reason, spirit, and appetite. But he thinks to understand what it is to be a just person, these are the parts of us that matter. And once you see that, he says, it becomes clear that a just person 
is the person in whom each of the parts is playing its proper role and not interfering with the role of the other, not usurping what's not properly its own. And so the idea here is reason's role is to rule. And the way it rules is by asking the question, what's best to do under the circumstances, answering the question, and when it rules, getting the person to act accordingly. And a person who doesn't ask or doesn't answer or doesn't act accordingly fails to be just. The same way the rulers of a society who find out what the best rules are and you know, ask what the best rules are, figure out what the best rules are, but they never legislate them, then the city doesn't count as just because it's not doing what the rulers have judged would be best to do. Max, you have your hand up? Well, I just wanted to let you know we're, we're coming to about 10 minutes and I wanted to just echo some things in the chat for you if it's appropriate, Jeff. You've been on such a roll. Uh, I've been <coughs> wrapped in attention here and everyone else has as well. The chat is re much reduced from last time, but there was a great conversation about meritocracy before and we can get into that. Um, but I do think uh, it's interesting that people have noted uh, Pranav has noted, I am just now realizing how similar, though not identical, this model of the soul is the Freud's three-part model. I think all of us had this uh, realization. Um, and uh, uh, Paul Connick writes, uh, sort of touching on something you had just been touching on regarding the taking of the rights of others. And what are these rights rooted? Doesn't Socrates' argument beg the question, aren't rights ultimately just conventional and consensual and therefore open to refutation and conflict? We've had the artifice of natural rights to take the question off the table by basing rights in transcendent authority. So I, I throw that out to you knowing we only have about 10 minutes left in this session. Okay, so uh, I'm glad to hear Pranav that you're now realizing how they're analogous. The actual argument form is taken directly from the Republic by Freud, though the conflicts he's interested in, he explains by the id, the ego, and the superego. But he has the same operative metaphysical assumption. No single thing can be in opposite states, blah, blah, blah. Paul, here's how I think about it, at least. The achievement of the Republic at this point is to, for, before we got to justice in the person, is to say, you're not even thinking about justice if you don't turn your attention to the question, what's rightfully whose? And there are a lot of arguments about public policy that never think about that. They just think about what will contribute to GMP or what will contribute to overall happiness or what will contribute to something or something. The, the, the most efficient shutdown of the virus. And if all they're thinking about are what will have the best consequences and not what's rightfully whose, they're not thinking about justice at all. Even if they're thinking about something about which we should have questions about justice. Now, when we think about justice, what I tried to convey is what he hasn't done is told us what's rightfully whose. Jeremy Bentham famously thought rights, talk of rights is nonsense on stilts. So he thought, in effect, there's no such thing as justice. He, he owned that. John Stuart Mill, who also shared Bentham's utilitarianism, yeah. the importance of the consequences, he was haunted by this because he was sure there was such a thing as justice. And at the end of the book, Utilitarianism, he develops a theory of justice, which is a theory of what's rightfully whose. And it's not a purely conventionalist theory. So it's not a theory detached from consequences, but it's a theory that picks out a special class of what's rightfully whose. So I think it's absolutely right to think, whoa, this hasn't settled questions of justice. It's just told me what the questions are. Now, one way you might think to settle is the one you mentioned, which is, oh, I know what's rightfully whose. 
whatever the conventions of a society says they are. That's with some variation how most people think of legal rights and what's legally rightfully yours. It's determined by what the laws that were actually passed have to say. We can ask about the justice or the injustice of those laws, but, but they're the laws that determine what's rightfully who's legally. You could have that view about morality too. But of course, earlier today, that was brought into doubt with the suggestion whole societies might be condemned as unjust, not because there's some convention they agree to, but by the light of some other standard. And Socrates is with that group of people. He says, if a society is ruled by people who are not properly suited to rule, or if the laws are enforced by people who are not properly suited to do the enforcing, the state is an unjust state and the people in it will suffer injustice. Um, and, it, and that's because we know what the people properly suited to rule are. They're the people who are looking out for the welfare of the whole city. And if that's not who's doing it, the city is going to go to hell in a handbasket. And even if the legislators are doing it, if law enforcement is not enforcing those laws in the way that those properly suited to play the role would enforce them, if they're too knee heavy, for instance, then there's going to be injustice. Because what people have a right to is what they would be given in a perfectly just society. And the condemnation of other societies is unjust is they failed to achieve that condition. So in, in the last few minutes here, I think the thing to say is we've gotten to the point where Socrates thinks he's identified what it is for you to be a just person. It's for you to be so constituted that you ask the question, what under these circumstances is the best thing for me to do? You're enabled to answer that. You have the resources to answer that. So a certain kind of ignorance could rob you of the capacity to be a just person. And not only can you answer that question, you can get yourself to act accordingly and you do. So too serious a case of weakness of will, too strong an addiction, too violent a fear. And even though you know what you ought to do, you won't be able to do it and you'll fail in your failure to act accordingly to be a just person. But a just person is the person who successfully does that. Now, what happens at this point is really quickly, Glauca and Adi Mancha say, oh, so justice is a kind of psychic health where the parts of you, the relevant parts are each playing their proper role. Now there's really no issue about what's so valuable about it. And once you see it's like health, what kind of fool would sacrifice their health for anything else? Isn't health obviously good for its own sake? To Socrates' credit, he doesn't take the win. And I just want to flag two things that happen here. First, you might ask yourself, what's the analogy with health? And I love the analogy. So I'm going to take a minute to remind you how it goes. If justice in the soul is a matter of each part of the soul playing its proper role, health in the body is a matter of each part of the body playing its proper role. Now, does every part of the soul have a proper role? He never says it does. Does every part of the body have a proper role? He never says it does. But what a heart attack is, 
and why it's a matter of being unhealthy is a part of your body that has a role is failing to do it. And what cancer is when it makes you unhealthy is the cancerous shells, cells intrude on the ability of other parts of your body to play their proper role. Your lungs from breathing, your brain from thriving, your kidneys from kidneying, to use a technical term. Being unhealthy, if you were to ask yourself, what is it for, for a person to be unhealthy? Socrates' answer is it's for that person's body to be such that there are things parts of the body have a right to do. It's rightfully their job that they're not getting to do, either because they're failing to do it or because something else is taking it from them, the ability to do it. I think it's a really powerful argument, insight into how to think about health such that right now we think maybe, you know, having, I forget what it is, the appendix removed or the tonsil removed, that's not all of a sudden being unhealthy, but only because there's nothing your body needs to do that's not being done. Pranav. Yeah, I know we're getting to time, so I just want to make sure, are we okay for me to ask something? Yes, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, okay. So um, I think the three part theory of the soul here is interesting, but um, I've read some psychological literature from some psych studies um, showing that in terms of how humans actually behave, even though like the rational part of us can pose the question, often it's not equipped to give an answer on whether a course of action um, is doable or not. So in other words, it takes our emotional faculties, as people have shown in some studies, to actually be decisive on certain positions. And I'm wondering, um, basically, that makes me think, in other words, like the veracity to which we can trust Socrates' assertion of the rational component ruling. So I just want to know what your thoughts are on sort of like how empirical some of these conclusions are and whether you think they can be tested um, by parts of science. So. A lot of theoretical posits are there to make sense of the world we find with respect to some dimension or other. If the question is what should rule, he's got his views about why that's reason. And you might be convinced by that and then empirical evidence might show you that nobody's actually ruled by reason. We're all unhealthy in that respect and so not just. Or you might discover, well, these people who seem paradigms of justice aren't being ruled by reason. So that's reason to question the usefulness of this theoretical posit to understand justice. Or you might think, and this is the evidence you were talking to, the way I laid it out, this is not quite the way he laid it out, but I did this because of the evidence you're alluding to. For reason to rule, it has to not just be able to ask, it has to be able to answer the question. It has to not just be able to answer the question, it must be able to get the person to do it. And you might discover cognitive attitudes, appetites or emotions or empathy or appreciation of others are a necessary condition for the effectiveness of reason ruling. So that would give you a reason if you were raising kids and you say, I want my kid to be a just kid, you might be convinced I have to get the kid to appreciate there are other human beings like him in the room. He has to be empathetic. If he doesn't have it, he can cognitively figure out, but he just won't be guided by what he's discovered. And that's a way of putting various things into that part the emotional parts that are important to reason ruling. Or sometimes you might say, oh, one part ruling is a matter of other parts willingly obey. So it's not all a matter of what's happening in the ruling part. It depends on the moderation and the justice of the other parts. Their role is to comply. 
What it looks like empirical evidence can't tell you is what's rightfully whose or what justice is. It can only tell you once you've worked out what those things are, whether some particular thing satisfies those ideas. So we should stop now and come yeah. back. This is lunchtime, right? This is like, yeah, we want to make sure that everyone can feed their body so that their body parts can do the things that they're supposed to do to handle the third part. Uh, before we go, I just want to thank, um, I think Jeff Lang had written this really interesting uh, implications of the ideal commonwealth. The first is that there's a necessary role for love or better yet, loving kindness. And the second is a willingness and indeed an affirmative effort at inclusion. I think that's a really interesting point there. And I, I encourage you all to go and look at the chat of some wonderful conversations there. We now have only 40 minutes as opposed to 45 minutes to eat, but it's been well worth it. We've been fed with wonderful, wonderful knowledge and insights. Thanks again, uh, Jeff, for uh, leading two great sessions. Let's all go eat. You are welcome to stay here and chat with each other all you want. That's one of the beauties of this format. Uh, but I'm going to turn off my camera and get some food. And I encourage you to do that as well. But uh, you're welcome to stay. We'll see everyone at 1.15, okay? Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.